Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing this course on Substantive Criminal Law. Today, we will discuss Lesson 6, which deals with general exceptions to criminal liability. So students, in the previous lesson, we discussed how mistake of fact is a defense to criminal liability. We also discussed how immaturity of age and understanding accord exemption from criminal liability. Similarly, intoxication which is involuntary intoxication is a valid defense from criminal liability. Then we also discussed how Medical insanity is different from legal insanity and it is only legal insanity which can provide a person protection from criminal liability. So now continuing from there, today we will discuss the remaining exceptions to criminal liability. So let us begin with the defense of consent. The term consent means to agree, accept, approve, assent or permit after a thoughtful consideration. The law relating to consent is loosely based on the maxim volenti non fit injuria. Volenti means voluntary assumption of risk. This Latin maxim when literally translated implies to the consenting no injury is done. So that means if you have consented voluntarily to take the risk of injury then you cannot be said to be a victim and the other party cannot be held to be an accused person. What section 25 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita deals with is act not intended and not known to be likely to cause death or grievous hurt done by consent. What it says, nothing which is not intended to cause death or grievous hurt and which is not known by the doer to be likely to cause death or grievous hurt is an offence by reason of any harm which it may cause or be intended by the doer to cause to any person above 18 years of age who has given consent whether expressed or implied to suffer that harm or by reason of any harm which it may be known by the doer to be likely to cause to any such person who has consented to take the risk of that harm. See, I will explain it with the help of an illustration. A and Z agree to fence with each other for amusement. So, this agreement implies the consent of each to suffer any harm which in the course of such fencing may be caused without foul play. See here what is important is that none of them should be acting malafide and the damage or the harm which is a natural consequence is something to which both the parties have consented to but they have not consented to foul play. So if anybody tries to manipulate this consent in order to inflict more harm than would have been ordinarily inflicted in the course of a natural play then this exception would not be available. So, if A while playing fairly hurts A, hurts Z, then in such cases A would be held of committing no offence. But what is important is that the game should be played fairly, there should be a consent on both the parties and then there should be no foul play. Then section 26 BNS, act not intended to cause death, 
done by consent in good faith for person's benefit. It says nothing which is not intended to cause death is an offence by reason of any harm which it may cause or be intended by the doer to cause or be known by the doer to be likely to cause to any person for whose benefit it is done in good faith and who has given a consent whether express or implied to suffer that harm or to take the risk of that harm. So, what is required is one the act should not have been intentionally done to cause harm but the act should have been done in good faith and the intention of the act should be to cause benefit not to cause harm to the other person. This is further explained with the help of an illustration. A. A surgeon knowing that a particular operation is likely to cause the death of Z who suffers under the painful complaint but not intending to cause Z's death and intending in good faith for Z's benefit performs that operation on Z with Z's consent. So, here the objective of the surgeon was to alleviate the pain or suffering of that person. Here A has committed any offence? The answer is no, A has not committed any offence here. Then under section 27 of the BNS acts done in good faith for benefit of child or person of unsound mind by or by consent of guardian. See a person who is not of sound mind or a person who is a minor. So, such people they are required to be kept under the care and custody of a guardian because minors, persons of unsound mind they are considered to be incapable in law of knowing what is best for them. So, how can you expect them to safeguard their own interests? So, in such cases it is the guardian who has the capacity to take decisions on their behalf. So, what does the law say? Nothing which is done in good faith for the benefit of a person under 12 years of age or a person of unsound mind by or by consent either express or implied of the guardian or other person having lawful charge of that person is an offence by reason of any harm which it may cause or be intended by the doer to cause or be known by the doer to be likely to cause to that person provided that this exception shall not extend to the intentional causing of death or the attempting to cause death because see intentional causing of death or attempting to cause death cannot be said to be an act which is performed in good faith. What is protected here is to protect the minor or the protect of unsound mind if some harm is to be undertaken, if some emergency surgery is to be agreed upon, if some lesser damage is to be agreed upon in order to prevent a larger damage. Suppose there is gangrene setting in the limbs and if a leg is to be amputated to save the rest of the body then in such cases a minor or a person of unsound mind cannot be expected to give the consent. So, such a harm if it has to be incurred in order to safeguard the minor or the person of unsound mind from a greater harm now that is something which is justified provided it was bona fide. Then it does not extend to the doing of anything which the person doing it knows to be likely to cause death for any purpose other than preventing of death or grievous hurt or the curing of any grievous disease or infirmity. So, you see there has to be something very very important significant to the, for, to the health of the minor or to the health of the person of unsound mind so as to justify the harm that was undertaken in order to prevent a bigger harm. The voluntary causing of grievous hurt or to the attempting to cause grievous hurt unless it be for the purpose of preventing death or grievous hurt or the curing of any grievous disease or infirmity, the abetment of any offence to the committing of which offence it would not extend. This is further explained with the help of an illustration. 
A in good faith for his child's benefit without his child's consent has his child cut for the stone by a surgeon knowing it to be likely that the operation will cause the child's death but not intending to cause the child's death. A is within the exception in as much as his object was the cure of the child. The intention was removal of the stone. The intention was not killing of the child. Then consent which is given under fear or misconception. Section 28 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita says a consent is not such a consent as is intended by any section of the Sanhita if the consent is given by a person under fear of injury or under a misconception of fact and if the person doing the act knows or has reason to believe that the consent was given in consequence of such fear or misconception or if the consent is given by a person who from unsoundness of mind or intoxication is unable to understand the nature and consequence of that to which he gives his consent or unless the contrary appears from the context if the consent is given by a person who is under 12 years of age. Next is section 29 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita which talks about exclusion of facts which are offences independently of harm caused. The exceptions in sections 25, 26 and 27 do not extend to acts which are offences independently of any harm which they may cause or be intended to cause or be known to be likely to cause to the person giving the consent or on whose behalf the consent is given. See there is an illustration causing of miscarriage. Unless it is caused in good faith for the purpose of saving the life of the woman is an offence independently of any harm which it may cause or be intended to cause to the woman. See killing of a child in the mother's womb in its itself is a crime. So unless and until it was necessitated that is unless and until it was the life of the mother that was at stake till that time miscarriage is an offence independently of the harm that it caused to the caring mother. Therefore, it is not an offence by reason of such harm and the consent of the woman or of her guardian to the causing of such miscarriage does not justify the act. So, even if it was done with the consent of the caring mother, even if it was done with the consent of the guardian, but unless and until such miscarriage was necessitated in order to save the life of the woman, the consent given by the guardian or by the woman herself, it is not sufficient to justify the harm that was caused to that unborn child. Next is acts done in good faith for benefit of a person without consent. See sometimes a person might not be in a position to give his consent or sometimes the person might not be in a position to understand what he is refusing to and it might be necessary to save his life. So if an act is done in good faith and it was so urgent that it was necessary to save the life of a person, so if such an act is done even without the consent of the other person that would also be protected under the law provided the good faith is there, bona fide, the acts should be done in good faith, that is act should be done bona fide. Section 30 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita says, nothing is an offence by reason of any harm which it may cause to a person for whose benefit it is done in good faith even without that person's consent. If the circumstances are such that it is impossible for that person to signify consent or if that person is incapable of giving consent and has no guardian or other person in lawful charge of him from whom it is possible to obtain consent in time for the thing to be done with benefit. 
but there are provisos where this exception shall not be applicable. The law says this exception shall not extend to the intentional causing of death or the attempting to cause death. Second, the doing of anything which the person doing it knows to be likely to cause death for any purpose other than the preventing of death or grievous hurt or the curing of any grievous disease or infirmity. Next, the voluntary causing of hurt or to the attempting to cause hurt for any purpose other than the preventing of death or hurt and fourth, the abatement of any offence to the committing of which offence it would not extend. Illustrations Z is thrown from his horse and is insensible. A. A surgeon finds that Z requires to be trepanned. A. Not intending Z's death but in good faith for Z's benefit performs the operation before Z recovers his power of judging for himself. Here A has not committed any offence. Why? Because it was immediately some action was required and the urgent action that was required that was taken by the person in good faith to save the life of that person. So, that is protected under law. Next illustration. Z is carried off by a tiger. A fires at the tiger knowing it to be likely that the shot may kill Z but not intending to kill Z and in good faith intending Z's benefit because he knows that unless he fires at the tiger, unless he takes his chances, the death of Z is imminent. It will happen because the tiger has carried him away. So, he takes his chances but that should be in good faith. Here A's bullet gives Z a mortal wound. A has committed no offence. Why? Because the act was done not to hurt the other person but to save the other person. Then illustration number 3. A. A surgeon sees a child suffer an accident which is likely to prove fatal unless an operation be immediately performed. There is no time to apply to the child's guardian. See ordinarily decisions regarding the health or decisions regarding any procedures to be performed on a child are to be performed only after obtaining the guardian's consent. But in case of emergencies when there is no time to obtain the guardian's consent, if a surgeon he wants to perform his moral obligation and take care of the child in good faith, so what is the harm in that? And that is what the law says that if A, a surgeon sees a child suffer an accident which is likely to prove fatal unless an operation be immediately performed, there is no time to apply to the child's guardian. A performs the operation in spite of the entreaties of the child intending in good faith the child's benefit. A has committed no offence. Next illustration. A is in a house which is on fire with Z a child. People below hold out a blanket. Now obviously why have they spread out the blanket? So that if anybody wants to jump out of the burning house so a blanket will at least cushion the fall. So, what this person A does? He drops the child from the house top, knowing it to be likely that the fall may kill the child, but not intending to kill the child and intending in good faith the child's benefit. Here, even if the child is killed by the fall, A has committed no offence. Why? Because the act was done bona fide. The act was done because it was required in the circumstances to prevent a more harm, to prevent a greater harm to the child. So, an act which is done bona fide, act which is done for the benefit of a person, even if it does not result in that benefit, even if it leads to some harm, still that would be protected under the law. But what is required to be proven is the bona fides of the accused and second thing, the intention of the accused in doing the act was benefit of the other person, not harm to the other person. Then 
this section further explains that mere pecuniary benefits if we are talking about benefits merely in monetary terms. So, that is not a benefit within the meaning of sections 26, 27 and section 30 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. The next defense is bona fide communications. Section 31 BNS talks about communication made in good faith. It says, no communication made in good faith is an offence by reason of any harm to the person to whom it is made if it is made for the benefit of that person. Look at the illustrations. A. A surgeon in good faith communicates to a patient his opinion that he cannot live. The patient dies in consequence of the shock. A has committed no offence though he knew it to be likely that communication might cause the patient's death. But suppose there is an enemy of this person who is on deathbed and he, this person is critically ill and the enemy knows that this person is suffering from a very uh, uh, sensitive medical condition and he can collapse any time and then he is not in a position to take any uh, bad news. And if a person deliberately so as to expedite the death of that person goes and communicates some information even if the information is true but he does it with the wrong intent in order that the person may be shocked by that information and collapse if the person does so and if the person who is on bed who is uh, hospitalized or who is critically ill if such a person suffers death because of that so that would not be protected herein herein what is protected is communications which are made in good faith bona fide without any kind of bad intentions without any kind of ill will to the person to whom they are communicated. So, what are the essential ingredients to invoke the benefit of this exception? 1. The communication must be made in good faith. A person is said to have acted in good faith when it can be shown that due care and caution was exercised by that person. The communication must have been made for the benefit of that person. Here the term benefit should be understood to include physical, mental, psychological, material or supernatural benefit. So, it is a very broad based definition of the term benefit here, but all said and done the communication should be made to the other person with a view to cause some benefit to the other person. Communications made to a person with ill will or with the intent of causing harm to such person cannot be accepted as being made for his benefit and so they would not be protected under section 31. Communications that are made with a malicious ulterior objective of disturbing the peace of mind of the person to whom it is made would not be protected under this section. When we talk about the term harm, so the term harm in this section would include an injurious mental reaction such as nervous shock, losing consciousness, becoming hysterical or related physical reaction. Physical injury is not protected under this section. Harm in this section would include an injurious mental reaction such as nervous shock, losing consciousness, becoming hysterical or any related physical reaction. Knowledge can exist without intention. Thus, communications made with the knowledge of possibility of some resultant harm would be protected provided the communication was made in good faith for the benefit of that person. So, what is required is that the communication should be made bona fide, the objective should be benefit of that person and not to cause harm to any person. Next exception to criminal liability is duress. The common law maxim actus me invito factus non est mens actus means that an act done, my, uh, done by me against my will is not my act at all. Thus, 
acts that are committed by a person under duress, force, threat or compulsion cannot be said to be his voluntary acts and thus it would not be fair to hold a person criminally liable for acts that are done by that person under any kind of a compulsion, threat or duress. We have a provision in the substantive criminal law section 32 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita which deals with it. It talks about acts to which a person is compelled by threats. What does the provision say? Except murder and offences against the state punishable with the death, nothing is an offence which is done by a person who is compelled to do it by threats which at the time of doing it reasonably cause the apprehension that instant death to that person will otherwise be the consequence. See, if somebody points a gun at your temple and asks you to break open the lock of a safe. Now, since you are acting under an imminent threat of death, the act of breaking open the safe, although it was your act, but it was not a voluntary act. So, you cannot be held guilty of the same because you were compelled to do that act and the threat was of imminent death. Then, provided that the person doing the act did not of his own accord or from reasonable apprehension of harm to himself short of instant death place himself in the situation by which he became subject to such constraint. So, unless and until it is a harm which is not like uh, instant death till that time you will not be protected if you have placed yourselves in the situation by which you have become subjected to such constraints. Explanation 1. A person who of his own accord or by reason of a threat of being beaten joins a gang of decoits knowing their character. Now, such a person is not entitled to the benefit of this exception on the ground of his having been compelled by his associates to do anything that is an offence by the law. Because see, we say that a man is known by the company that he keeps. So, if you have voluntarily associated with criminals despite knowing their nature and character, there is every possibility that tomorrow they will compel you to also indulge in those criminal act. So, if you have yourselves placed yourself in such a situation, the law will not protect you. Then explanation 2, a person seized by a gang of decoits and forced by threat of instant death to do a thing which is an offence by law. For example, a smith compelled to take his tools and to force the door of a house for the decoits to enter and plunder it is entitled to the benefit of this exception because he was under a threat of imminent death. So, unless and until he would have broken open the lock, these persons they would have killed him instead. So, he did what he had to do when he was compelled by that threat of imminent death. So, what are the essential elements to claim the defense of duress as a defense to criminal charge? The person must be compelled by threats. A person is said to be forced when he is left with no freedom of choice. Section 32 recognizes the principle of duress per minas. Per minas is a Latin term which means use of threat of loss of life or menace. The fear which prompted his action must be fear of instant death. See, we are talking only about that kind of fear which would compel a person to act because the fear is of instant death. So, this section will not apply in case of any threat less than fear of instant death. Then, threat must exist at the time of the commission of the offence. Acts committed after the fear of death ceases will not be protected under this section. Similarly, threat of death to be executed in future or some other time also does not qualify as fear of 
instant death and thus is not acceptable as a defense. See, if somebody threatens you that if you don't do this crime today, I'm going to kill you in future. Now, you don't have this defense of duress. You are not compelled to do that act because there is no threat of imminent death. And if somebody is threatening to kill you in future, you always have time to have recourse to protection of public authorities. So, in such cases, you would not be justified in causing harm to any other person. Then, the person should not have voluntarily exposed himself to the constraint. The proviso to section 32 makes it clear that the person doing the act should not of his own accord have placed himself in such a situation by reason of which he became subject to such compulsion or threat. So, defense of duress, this is subject to two exceptions. One is murder and the second one is offenses against state punishable with death. So, defense of duress is not available in case an accused has committed any of these actions. The next exception to criminal liability is trivial acts. Section 33 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita talks about acts causing slight harm. It says, nothing is an offence by reason that it causes or that it is intended to cause or that it is known to be likely to cause any harm if that harm is so slight that no person of ordinary sense and temper would complain of such harm. So, you are not supposed to waste the time of the courts by complaining of about such trivial matters that no other person of ordinary sense and calmness. So, here see, here we are not talking about hypersensitive people. If any other person placed in the same situation as the one who has gone to complain would also have complained. That is, here we apply the test of a reasonable person. How any other person of ordinary sense and calmness would have reacted in the given situation? That would be the touchstone to decide whether it should be entertained by law or not. But if it is so trivial that no one else would have bothered to complain about it, then in such cases that would not be a crime in itself. So, nobody can be held guilty for committing such trivial acts. Now, we will move on to one of the most important exemptions to criminal liability under the substantive law of crimes and that is the right of private defense. So, students, first of all, let me introduce you to the right of private defense. The first law of nature is self-preservation. Self-preservation is the most basic instinct and the most basic right of any person. If tomorrow any law also asks you to give up your right to self-preservation, that law will be ineffective. Nobody is going to follow a law which commands you to give up your own self-preservation because that is the most inherent right in any human being. So, it is the most basic instinct to defend oneself. The right of self-defense is an extremely important right, but no right can be absolute. Every right is to be enjoyed within the legally prescribed limits. So, law gives you a right of private defense. At the same time, the law also imposes certain limitations on the exercise of such right. So, state puts limits on the exercise of self-help and allows it only when state help is not available. See, ordinarily, force is something which has been monopolized by the state. So, it is only the state which has the power to use force against other persons. Self-help is permissible only when that state help is not available. See, we are not allowed to take the law in our own hands unless legal help is not available and the circumstances necessitate you to do an act which you would not have otherwise done in case legal help was available. In India, 
the right of private defense is circumscribed by the governing statute that is the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. What it means is that it is not an absolute right. You have a right of self-preservation, you have a right to defend yourselves, but it is not absolute in nature. There are limitations on the exercise of that right and the limitations where have they been provided within the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita itself. The right provided under section 34 to 44 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita is essentially a defensive right available only as a means of protection when the circumstances clearly justify it. So, right of private defense is to be used as a shield and not as a sword. Right of private defense cannot be allowed to be pleaded or availed as a pretext for vindictive or retributive purposes. It is a preventive right used for protection against unlawful aggressions. It can be used to repel the aggressor, but it cannot be used to punish him. It cannot be used as a medium of taking revenge. See, the law allows you to protect yourself till the time the threat is imminent, till the time the threat is looming large over you. Once the threat has abated, once the accused flees the scene, then you do not have the right to follow him or hunt him down because then that would be a punitive exercise of the right, then that would amount to retribution or revenge. And what the law says is that private defense is to be used as a shield for the purposes of protection. It is not to be used as a sword for the purposes of retribution or punishment. And then another important point is aggressor has no right of private defense. See, if you are the one who has committed intentional aggression on the other person and you realize that the tables have turned and the other person is a stronger adversary, then in such cases can you say that now I should be entitled to right of private defense? The answer is no. If you are the aggressor, you cannot get the right of private defense. So, before coming to the legislative provisions, let me clarify here that the right that the law talks about is right of private defense. It does not talk about right of self-defense. So, the law entitles you to take law in your own hands to protect yourself, to protect your friends, relatives, neighbors, even total strangers because this is a private exercise of a public right. See, it is when you are trying to repel an aggression, an aggressor who might be trying to harm you, who might be trying to harm any other person. So, normally as I said, force has been monopolized by the state, but when state help is not available and you can't afford to be a sitting duck for any person to just come and harm you or come and harm anyone else. So, in such cases when a private individual exercises the right, this is known as right of private defense. This is not merely a right of self-defense. It is known as right of private defense because it is a private exercise of the right which justifies usage of power, usage of force to protect yourselves and also to protect anyone else whom, whosoever might be facing aggression from a uh, illegal uh, source. Some Any uh, person might be uh, out to harm that person or out to harm his property. Then in such cases, it is a private exercise of force. Section 34 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita says, Nothing is an offence which is done in the exercise of right of private defence. The expression right of private defence has not been defined under section 34. It is just a one liner. There is just one line to the section and it lays down an absolute rule. Nothing is an offence which is done in the exercise of right of private defence. So, let us just analyse this section. Section 34, it lays down a general rule that nothing is an offence which is done in exercise of right of private defence. Bharatiya Nyay Sahita employs the term private defence and not self-defence, implying that it can be used for the purpose of defending not only one's self but others too. This right rests on the principle that where a crime is endeavoured to be committed by force, it is lawful to repel that force in self-defence. 
a plea of right of private defense cannot be based on surmises and speculation. Whether in a particular set of circumstances a person legitimately acted in the exercise of right of private defense is a question of fact to be determined on the facts and circumstances of each case and the entire incident must be examined with care and viewed in its proper setting. See no test in the abstract for determining such a question can be laid down. So, it is a question of fact to be decided on the basis of peculiar facts and circumstances of each and every case. Section 35, it provides about right of private defense of the body and of property. It says every person has a right subject to the restrictions contained in section 37 to defend first his own body and the body of any other person against any offence affecting the human body. Secondly, the property whether movable or immovable of himself or of any other person against any act which is an offence falling under the definition of theft, robbery, mischief or criminal trespass or which is an attempt to commit theft, robbery, mischief or criminal trespass. So, you see right of private defense of body is very very broad. It is available in respect of any offense that might affect the human body. But when we talk about right of private defense of property, there are limited number of offenses which have been mentioned in the law itself. What are those offenses against which right of private defense of property is available? It should be either theft, robbery, mischief or criminal trespass or it may be an attempt to commit theft, robbery, mischief or criminal trespass. See here there is one more thing that I would like to clarify is that when we talk about attempt to commit an offence against property similarly attempt to commit an offence against a human body. When the person who is under the threat has a reasonable apprehension that unless and until I act in my private defence the other person is going to harm me. So, as it is the harm has not been inflicted, but you have a reasonable apprehension that unless and until you act in your defense you would be subjected to that harm. So, that is in essence the right of private defense, it is a preventive right, you have every right to safeguard yourself, to protect yourself before any harm is inflicted on you, but what is required is that you should have a reasonable apprehension that unless and until I act urgently the other person is going to inflict some harm on me. So, if you have this kind of a reasonable apprehension only then you would be justified in taking law in your own hands and using force in order to repel the aggressor in order to protect your body or anyone else's body against any offence against human body and in cases of offences against property this would be relating to attempts to commit theft, robbery, mischief or criminal trespass. Now section 36 it lays down a very important rule. It talks about right of private defence against the act of a person of unsound mind etc. See right of private defence is a right of defence against a possible offence that is if a person is committing an offence against you, you have a right to defend yourselves. But what in case the purported offence which was to be committed was to be committed by someone who is suffering from unsoundness of mind or someone who is a minor by reason of immaturity of age or understanding or someone who by reason of uh, unsoundness of mind is incapable of understanding the nature or consequences of the actions that the person is doing. So, even if that person commits that act, even if a person of unsound mind stabs another person, it would not amount to an offence. So, where the act of the person of unsound mind would not amount to an offence, would the other party have a right to defend himself? because what the other person is doing would not amount to an offence. So, section 36 provides us a clarity in that kind of cases. What it says, when an act which would otherwise be a certain offence 
is not that offence by reason of the youth, the want of maturity of understanding, the unsoundness of mind or the intoxication of the person doing that act or by reason of any misconception on the part of that person. Every person has the same right of private defence against that act which he would have if the act were that offence. So, your right of private defence would be unaffected. See the law is very clear that although what the other person is doing would not amount to an offence, but that does not mean that you do not have a right to protect yourselves. Their right to protection is safeguarded. Now, you have every right to protect yourselves against acts which are committed by people capable of committing a crime or even by those people who are not capable of committing a crime by virtue of unsoundness or by virtue of immaturity of age and understanding. There are two illustrations to further clarify this. Illustration A, Z under the influence of madness attempts to kill A. Z is guilty of no offence, but A has the same right of private defence which he would have if Z were sane. So, you get it? It does not, the law does not say that you have to necessarily suffer at the hands of a person of unsound mind. If a person of unsound mind tries to do something which would harm you, you have every right to protect yourself. But then again, the degree of force which you use to protect yourself should not be disproportionate to the threat that you are faced with. Okay? You should not inflict more harm on the other person than was necessary to protect yourselves because here again I repeat that this is just a preventive right, this is just a protective right, this is not a right of retribution, this is not a right of punishment. Illustration B. A enters by night a house which he is legally entitled to enter. Z in good faith taking A for a housebreaker attacks A. Here Z by attacking A under this misconception commits no offence, but A has the same right of private defence against Z which he would have if Z were not acting under that misconception. Let us talk about acts against which there is no right of private defence. So, as I said earlier, no right is absolute and similarly right of private defence is also not absolute. There are certain limitations on the exercise of private defence and those limitations have been provided within the statute itself. So, section 37 talks about limitations on the exercise of right of private defence. So, what does the law say? There is no right of private defence against an act which does not reasonably cause the apprehension of death or of grievous hurt if done or attempted to be done by a public servant acting in good faith under colour of his office though that act may not be strictly justifiable by law. So, let us see what all is required in order to claim the right of private defence against public servants because what the law says is that if there is a public servant, you do not have any right of private defence against his lawful acts, even against his unlawful acts which may not be strictly justifiable by law, you have a limited right of private defence where the public servant is acting in good faith and he is acting under colour of his office. Colour of his office that is when he is under uniform, when he is acting under the exercise of powers which are vested in him under law. If he is acting in good faith, although the act is not strictly justifiable, but if he is acting in good faith in order to apprehend an offender, you do not have the right of private defence against his acts unless the acts cause a reasonable apprehension of death or of grievous hurt, in which case you would have a right of private defence against his acts also. Then, there is no right of private defence against an act which does not reasonably cause the apprehension of death or grievous hurt if done or attempt to be done by the direction of a public servant 
acting in good faith under color of his office though that direction may not be strictly justifiable by law. So, similarly just like it has been explained in clause A, similarly in clause B also clause A was talking about acts which are done by a public servant who was acting in good faith under color of his office. Clause B talks about acts which are done by the direction of a public servant who was acting in good faith under color of his office. So, even though the directions, even though the actions of public servant they might not be strictly justifiable by law, but still you would not have a right of private defense against his acts unless and until there was a reasonable apprehension of death or grievous hurt, then in such cases you would have right of private defense against unlawful acts of public servants also. Then there is no right of private defense in cases in which there is time to have recourse to protection of public authorities. See as I explained earlier, private defense is private exercise of a public right. So, which is available to private individuals only when state help is not available. So, when state help is available then in such cases the law does not allow you to act in your own self preservation or act for your protection. If you could have had time to recourse of protection of public authorities, if you have, would have informed the police, if you could have sought protection from them then in such cases you would not be justified in using force. See the usage of force would be justified only in cases where the threat was imminent and you did not have sufficient time to call the public authorities. Suppose you call the public authorities, but the authorities have not arrived and in the meantime the aggressor has arrived at your doorstep and the threat is imminent. Then obviously in such cases you will not keep waiting for the authorities to arrive in such cases when there is a reasonable apprehension of any kind of a harm, then the law allows you to exercise right of private defense. But if you have time to seek protection from public authorities, that is something which is mandated by the law. The right of private defense in no case extends to inflicting of more harm than it is necessary to inflict for the purpose of defense. Again, this is a right of defense. This is not a right to offend. So, the force that you use it should not be grossly disproportionate to the threat that you are faced with. Suppose the other person is carrying a very small stick and a thin stick and if he threatens to hit you with that you whip out a gun and shoot him. Now, the force which you have used to protect yourself, the force which you use to repel the aggressor is disproportionate to the harm that the person could have inflicted on you. See again, in such moments of passion it is impossible to weigh in golden scales and it is impossible to calculate with a composed mind that what is the harm that may be caused to me and what is the exact amount of harm that I would be justified in causing to the opposite party. But still there should be some semblance between the threat that you are faced with and the force which you use to repel that force. Again I use the term repel that force because what this law allows you is to protect yourselves and for protecting yourselves what you need to do is repel the aggressor and where necessary where you cannot repel that aggressor unless and until you cause some harm to that person then you would be justified in doing that also. But then this is a rule which needs to be kept in mind at all the time that right of private defense in no case extends to infliction of more harm than it is necessary to inflict for the purpose of defense. There are two further explanations appended to this section. Explanation 1. A person is not deprived of the right of private defense against an act done or attempted to be done by a public servant as such unless he knows or has reason to believe that the person doing the act is such public servant. See how do you know that the person who is doing the 
uh, harm is a public servant. So, unless and until the public servant declares himself to be that public servant, unless and until he is wearing his uniform or he shows his eye card or he tells you that who his, he is, till that time how is a ordinary person expected to know that the other person is a public servant. So, unless I am aware that the other person who is committing this aggression or me or who is asking me to do something or asking me to stop is a public servant, so I would have no reasons to believe that this person has a right to do what he is doing. In such cases, I would have the right to repel the aggressor and in that case, unless and until I know that the other person who is doing or attempting to do an act is a public servant, then I would not be deprived of my right of private defence. But if I know, if I have been told or if it is evident from the uniform or the demeanour or the words of the other person that he is a public servant, then I would not have a right of private defence against a public servant unless and until the public servant tries to inflict a grievous hurt or tries to cause the death of the other person. Coming to explanation 2, a person is not deprived of the right of private defence against an act done or attempted to be done by the direction of a public servant unless he knows or has reason to believe that the person doing the act is acting by such direction or unless such person states the authority under which he acts or if he has authority in writing unless he produces such authority if demanded. See any ordinary person who does not know that anyone is trying to do something under the directions of a public servant, so he has a right to know. Otherwise, my right of private defence would exist unaffected unless and until I have the opportunity of knowing that the other person is acting under the directions of a public servant. So, if I ask that other person under whose authority he is acting or if you have an authority of writing, then he is supposed to give answers to my questions and if the person does not answer, how am I supposed to know whether the person is acting under the authority of a public servant and if I do not know that, then there would be no limitation on the exercise of right of my private defence. But if I know that the person is acting under the directions of a public servant, then my right of private defence would be substantially curtailed and I cannot exercise right of private defence unless the act threatens me with grievous hurt or imminent threat of death. So, students that will be all for this lesson. We discussed about uh, so many general exceptions to uh, criminal liability. In the next session also, we will be continuing with the right of private defence, but in that session, we will be discussing in detail about the right of private defence of body. What are the circumstances which occasion the exercise of right of private defence of body till the extent of even causing the death of the aggressor? Similarly, we will also be dealing with right of private defence of property and the conditions which occasion the exercise of right of property, uh, of private defence of property to the extent of even causing the death of other person. Then also we will discuss those cases where a person cannot exercise his right of private defence without harming an innocent person. Then in such cases, is the person supposed to go ahead with his exercise of right of private defence or is a person supposed to hold back? So, in the next lesson, we will be discussing all this and much more. Hope you enjoyed this lesson. Thank you.